Um, <clears throat> all right, well, today then is, is the last uh, lecture in the series. Um, looking at these three uh, Impressionists who uh, really haven't been studied very much and yet who were all really influential members of, of the movement. And we've been we're investigating really why it has been that they have, you know, fallen, uh, you know, out of the, the public domain, so as to speak. Uh, the three of them all were connected to the Impressionist movement by Dugas. And I think this is a very significant uh, fact. Uh, Dugas, of course, um, someone who was interested very much in uh, modern life, who was interested, who was the painter of the city, not like the, the Holy Trinity, as I've, I've called them, the um, Impressionists such as Monet, Pizarro, uh, and <coughs> uh, Renoir who were much more outdoor painters. Uh, so it's going to be Dugas, who, as we know, was a difficult personality, uh, who, although he was central to the formation of the Impressionist movement, was probably the person who, in many ways, was responsible for it breaking up. He was a difficult uh, person to get on with. He had very demanding ideas. Uh, and it is he who will alienate uh, Pizarro, for example, uh, the, the problem of, of, uh, of the Dreyfus affair, uh, and gradually the movement will break up, uh, in particular because of his trying to introduce new people into the movement whom the other Impressionists didn't consider Impressionists, and we're going to look at them uh, in a moment. Now, one of these, of course, will be Jean Forin. Dugas was interested in these people mainly because um, Caillebotte, of course, was a bourgeois like him. Uh, also, he was interested, I suppose, in Bert uh, in uh, Mary Cassatt because Dugas had uh, relatives who worked in the United States, so that would have interested him. Um, but he was very interested in uh, Forin because of Forin's ability uh, to quickly capture um, the essence of modern life. And this indeed was what Dugas was trying to do. Now, Forin, differently from the other Impressionists, was someone who was intensely in involved in society and in every aspect of it. And his art really has to be understood um, as an involved art. Um, he will uh, work in all areas, particularly as, as a painter, but particularly as a social satirist, then as a political satirist, and then he will um, engage in the Second World War and his work will be used for as French propaganda against the Germans. Um, he also will work in the decorative arts and um, rises to a great significance in society, right? And from going from absolute abject poverty and bohemia, he, um, in the, at the end of his life, is rubbing shoulders with the Rothschilds and, in fact, is, is very sort of feared by the sort of bourgeois society for his wit, um, both in the way in which the captions that he puts under his um, uh, caricatures as for the caricatures himself. So um, he's a man who is constantly commenting on society and so in many ways he's the consummate um, idea that Baudelaire had of the painter of modern life. So I'm going to look at his life and his work, going through it chronologically, but showing at each stage how he has a kind of cynical commentary that shows us the, the back stage of life, literally the backstage of the opera and others, but also the, the goings on, the workings behind the bourgeois society that's not always particularly pretty. Very, very different, of course, from the utopian view that we have of, the, of society with uh, Renoir in particular. Now, he was born in Reims, in Reims, I suppose, uh, and the son of um, a painter decorator, so I suppose he grew up already with colours and brushes, um, comes up to Paris and enrolls uh, in the studio of um, a sculptor at the time, Carpeau. Now, some of you will be familiar with the work of this man. Uh, his sculpture is on the front of the Opera Garnier. This is um, the dance, um, which is supposed to portray, you know, the idea of the arts, dancing and Apollo in the centre. Um, but it, it, <clears throat> it gave such a sort of sense of joy and liberation 
that um, critics of the time were outraged. You know, this wasn't a sort of, you know, the kind of Greek and Roman statue that we wanted. And of course, um, people threw ink at it to try and get rid of it. Now, he only works there for a very short time. He already shows he has a social conscience. Um, a very important little bust of the emperor's uh, son is broken, and the man who's accidentally broken it is a man who actually has three children to support. And so the young Carpeau says, oh, look, I did it, because he knows that the man would have been um, you know, out of work had he been found out. So already he shows something that um, will inform most of his work throughout his life, this feeling um, of siding with the underdog, with the poor in society, while at the same time, he is nationalistic, religious, and anti-Semitic. He's, he's a very, very strange mixture of characteristics, as we'll see. But what he actually will gain and maintain in his life from his work with Carpool is this sense of line and sense of volume. Uh, and that will be, probably be what distinguishes his work, is being able with just a couple of lines to uh, give you a sense of movement, space, uh, and the essence um, of a person. So he leaves that and for a very short time works with one of the leading caricaturists of the day, André Gilles. Now at this time, um, uh, caricatures uh, and any kind of social satire was something very dicey to do. This is under the Second Empire and there were laws against people who did this. So by the time young Forin finally breaks out on his own and becomes a social satirist, he's actually working in a different set of circumstances that we'll see. Um, the censorship laws aren't as difficult and so on. So André Gilles confines himself to sort of caricature in the sense that he actually sort of you know, makes big heads, he deforms the character, and he, he keeps um, his caricature more or less to well-known um, figures such as Darwin here, dresses as a monkey, seem to be breaking through um, the hoops of um, hypocrisy and so on. And here you have Charles Dickens, you know, spanning London uh, and Paris. Now, he leaves him again, and you will look at the dates that by, we're now looking at 1870. What's 1870? The Commune. Remember this great civil war? He, as a young man, partakes in the bloody week, um, but survives, and then fights in the Prussian Civil War, you know, the Franco-Prussian War, and comes out of the war absolutely impoverished. I mean, he's, he'd been thrown out by his father, he'd been thrown out by Carpeau, comes back and has really nowhere to live, and lives absolutely off the skin of his pants. And it's at this time that he falls in with a really interesting group, the real Bohemia of the time, and not this isn't just the artistic bohemia of Montmartre, but I'm talking about the literary bohemia, um, often of the left bank. And so here we have um, one of these paintings by Fontaine Latour, who was a, an established painter, not an impressionist, but who often paints groups of people. You will remember the Batignolles group that we've um, looked at before. Um, and they're almost like Dutch paintings, you know, where you have a, a group of, of honourable people who have the same profession all sort of sitting together, very much like in, in the Dutch tradition. And what we have here um, are the group, it's called a corner of a table, but in actual fact it's a group of the writers of the time. And these were the Parnassian poets, a group of poets who had rebelled against Romanticism and were into art for art's sake, because um, they felt that Romanticism had become sterile. Now, at the time that um, this was being painted, there were these two very influential poets who were sitting here, almost apart from the rest of the group. This is Arthur Rimbaud, Arthur Rimbaud, and this is Paul Verlaine. Now, you would have, anyone who's done French studies will remember these people. Now, they were, at the time that this was painted, already rebelling against the Parnassian movement, um, and they called themselves the Zutistes, the Zut meaning, you know, bugger you sort of group. Uh, and in fact, you can see that where he has his back turned to the rest of the group. Now there's a, a, a bunch of flowers here because there was another member of the Parnassian group who refused to be painted at the same table as uh, Verlaine and Rimbaud, and so they had to replace him by some rhododendrons. <laughs> um, now this is Arthur Rimbaud. He, the story of Rimbaud is as a young, a very precocious, extraordinary talent who will be the leader of the decadent poet movement. Those of you who know French poetry will know his Bateau Yves, the drunken boat, illuminations, um, a new kind of prose poetry full of extraordinary images that are almost surrealistic in form. 
Now, he, as a young poet, he starts writing at 17. He enters into a, a, a homosexual relationship with Paul Verlaine, uh, which goes horribly wrong. <clears throat> Verlaine shoots at him uh, and you know, tries to kill him. Well, not tries to kill him, but obviously there was something going wrong. And Verlaine is sent to prison for homosexuality and for um, attempted murder and spends two years, which is really very much for that, um, in uh, prison writing very sort of melancholy poems. Um, after this, Rambo will never write another poem. So this extraordinary work that we have of his is written in something like two and a half years. Um, after that, he goes off and works as a gun runner in Africa, extraordinary, travels the world, and dies at the age of 37 um, of cancer of the leg. But in the meantime, you see this, this, this uh, what he says, um, je dis qu'il faut être voyant. I say one must be a seer, make oneself a seer. A poet makes himself a seer by an immense, long, deliberate derangement of all the senses. Life is a farce we are all forced to endure. So this is this beginning of this idea of existentialist idea of, you know, there is no sense in life, you just have to make your own sense of it. Um, I urge you to read some of his work. Um, it's very accessible in the sense it's not just poems. Now this was um, Paul Verlaine who ends up the end of his life um, drowned in absinthe, um, lamenting his lost glory days with, um, uh, with, uh, with Arthur Rimbaud. Uh, and it becomes a sort of institution on the left bank. Now, these are the kind of poems he, he wrote. Um, the translations are, are really are not very good at all. Um, but this, this one, they're, they're beautiful sound poems, that, that almost as though you can hear them being sung. Um, il pleure dans mon cœur comme il pleut sur la ville. Quelle est cette longueur qui pénètre mon cœur Au bruit doux de la pluie par terre et sur les toits pour un cœur qui s'ennuie au champ de la pluie. All right, now it's, it's the sound of the words that are so essential. When you actually translate it, 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 it doesn't really come over very much. But it's this gentle lament, really, I suppose, of sort of melancholy of sort of revising his life. And this is the kind of poetry that he became famous for, very different from the poetry of Rimbaud. Well, for our point, why am I talking about this? It's because that Forin, for several, about six months of his life, lives in the same digs as uh, Arthur Rimbaud. Um, Rimbaud is a very difficult person to, to, to live with, as you can imagine. Uh, had huge rage, as temperamental. Um, but Forin actually paints um, what was thought to be a portrait of Rimbaud at this time. It's, it's the question mark because it's not sure that it is Rimbaud. However, um, with the photographs that we have, it looks as though it is. Now, one thing I'm going to be emphasizing during this lecture is that the two Impressionists who will influence uh, Forin the most are going to be Manet and Dugas, both of whom, as I said before, are painters of the city, painters of figures, painters of modern life. And, um, Forin is not interested in the plein air outdoor painting um, of the Impressionists, you know, this idea of, of how light is broken up and the series of paintings and this experimentation with palettes and so on. He's actually gone beyond that. He, he joins the movement when he's 26, which means he's by far the youngest of the Impressionists. He's about something like 30 years younger, probably, than Manet. Anyway, I want you to look at this. This is 1874. And in 1876, Manet produces um, a portrait of one of the great symbolist poets um, of the time, Stéphane Mallarmé. And you will see a great similarity in the way in which the two figures have been depicted. And it's no coincidence that they are both poets. Um, um, out of the movement of rebellion of uh, Rimbaud, you, you end up with the great uh, symbolist poetry of Stéphane Mallarmé, who, by the way, was the godfather of uh, uh, Bert Morisot's child. Um, he also, and uh, this is very important because um, Forin, um, of all of the Impressionists, is the person who is the closest to the avant-garde literature. Right? The other Impressionists, of course, were close to Zola, the, impression, the <coughs> realist writer. But um, uh, Forin is, is going to be on that cutting edge. Now, he becomes very friendly with um, a writer called Huisman. Now, those of, you, those of you who've gone to see the... Um, uh, exhibition of um, uh, Gustave Moreau uh, will have seen um, Sal Salome dancing. Now, 
Uh, in his novel Against Nature, Wiesmann talks about this decadent character, Des Sand, who lives at the night, who everything is, is completely back to front. You know, decadence is the exaltation of the extraordinary, the, the unreal, the, everything which is unnatural. Uh, and um, he talks very much about the painting of Salome. You know, she is for him the epitome of everything which is unreal. So um, it is going to be Wiesmann who will be responsible for the great sort of conversion or reversion to um, Catholicism um, of Thorin in the year 1900. So he maintains his roots with, with, these group, with this group of people. Now, he, after for coming out of the army um, and living with uh, Rimbaud, uh, he has his work rejected by the Salon and meets uh, Degas, who recognises this sort of talent for the painting of modern life that he has and invites him to exhibit with the Impressionists. Uh, and indeed, Forin will exhibit in the 4th, the 5th, the 7th and the 8th exhibition. And that's a considerable uh, corpus of work. And he, but he's faithful to this group, even though at the last exhibition his work is also accepted by the Salon. So here we have, um, this is another one of these paintings of, of Fontaine Latour, you know, very in the Dutch style of grouping people according to their profession. Um, he is not in this group, but I wanted to um, show you, of course, the figure of Manet, who will be so important to him. Now, the Impressionist movement wasn't just really about just producing different art. It was a group of people who stayed together and who um, made, had these discussions every Thursday and Sunday at the Café Gerbois up in Montmartre, or in, in the 9th arrondissement at the Place Pigalle. And this was a kind of hotbed of new issues which were discussed. And people who were different and who had new ideas could come and bounce them off this group. So um, the Impressionist movement wasn't just about art, it was about also encouraging new ideas. And so this was where Forin would come with these people who were considerably older than him. This is what it looked like at the time. Um, that's the, um, this would have been the, the, black, the dead rat. And over here you would actually have the um, Café Nouvelle Latin where they also met and talked. I just want to give you, um, a, to show you he, how sort of he was quite intimate with this group. He actually sketched portraits of people. Now he doesn't have a lot in common with Pizarro. Pizarro, of course, the great painter of landscapes, and of course also a Sephardic Jew, um, which will mean great problems for uh, relationship with Forin and Degas uh, when the Dreyfus affair um, breaks out. Now, um, another member of the group whom uh, Degas invites in. Uh, is Raffaelli. Now, you, he's probably what someone that we should do a lecture on. He um, was invited to uh, exhibit, and the other Impressionists didn't think he was an Impressionist. They were getting rather fed up with Degas imposing people whom they thought were outside their ideas on them. And uh, Raffaelli actually was going to bring in something like 72 paintings, and they thought, well, this was just going to swamp their work. And so this is one of the reasons why the group actually break up. But Raffaelli, of course, um, is going to be very much like Plonga in the sense that he is going to paint um, a different aspect of the city. He's going to paint the working class, the underdog of the city. In fact, he's the only one of this group who really, in the early part of his life, actually concentrates on the outcasts of the outer boulevards. So here you have um, the absinthe drinkers, you know, this sense of, of a woman with two young children and a baby, and of course her husband, what's he doing? He's drinking absinthe at, at the bar. So um, I want now to go to another one of these Fontana tools. They're, they're really quite interesting as, as sort of documents in many ways because they, they give us different groupings of people. So here you have his homage to Delacroix, the great, the great uh, romantic artist. And in this you actually have, of course, Manet, you have Whistler, you have Fontaine Latour himself, Jean Fleury, the great critic, but also Charles Baudelaire, another poet. Now, he, uh, Charles Baudelaire was the poet who had written at the time of when Manet was coming, starting to exhibit, and he writes a long article called The Painting of Modern Life, or The Painter and Modern Life, where he talks about what is modern life, what is modernity. It's about change. Um, it's about the, the uh, new ideas of beauty, which are always inevitably um, caught up with something which is fleeting, um, which is rather melancholy. Um, he talks about the importance of the crowd 
uh, and the, the sort of anonymous nature of the man in the city. How the, um, I think we quoted last week, everything changes, but nothing has changed in my melancholy. So this importance for the city in the development of modern life. And when he talks about the painter, whom he thinks is the greatest painter of modern life, he talks about someone we don't really hear about now, is Constantin Guy. Now, uh, Guy was someone who, in particular, um, was interested in um, sketching and lithography, which, of course, will be something that we'll look at with fire, but um, was painting the essence of modern life, you know, this idea um, that everything in the city is a transaction, right, that everything can be bought and sold, you know, the old eternal values um, just are no longer there. Everything is, is fleeting, evanescent. Uh, and slightly melancholy. And you have this sense here of this when he depicts prostitutes. Now, um, this is one of the, the major themes um, of his work. But here you have, you'll notice um, that all of these women look um, exactly the same. Right? They're, they're not differentiated, they're sort of a crowd. Um, and they sort of are, are crowding across the, the picture plane. So there's this, this sense of the new city. Now, it wasn't just Constantin Guise who painted um, prostitution. We have, of course, all of those paintings by Dugas, right, again, who was fascinated by this sort of underbelly of the modern city, the modern life, and how these transactions in human flesh, you know, are the basis, I suppose, of many transactions in the city. So um, brothels and, and prostitution were an important part of, of life both for the bourgeoisie and all men at the time. 99% I mean, of men who weren't in the clerk, you know, in the church frequented brothels. Um, it was considered a perfectly acceptable um, activity. You know, there was no morality attached to it one way or another. That was the way things were. That's how you started out you, losing your virginity. You started out in a brothel and you just kept going. Um, the prostitutes also start to invade not just the um, footpaths, um, but also literature and art in the second half of the 19th century. And you just need to think of the novels that were written with the main characters who are prostitutes. For example, Nana of Zola, um, Wiesmann, whom we were just talking about, writes a novel called um, Marthe, which is about a prostitute, the Goncourt write about Elisa, and so on. So you, and in fact, Madame Bovary, even, you know, Flaubert's book, she's not a prostitute, but she's, it's a, she's a heroine, but she's an adulterous woman. All right, so you, you're starting to get this, you know, no longer the great sort of feminine, pure, virginal heroine of the first half of the century. There's this fascination with this sort of underside and women's sexuality as well. Now, what, of course, comes up here is um, Dugas' fascination with this uh, idea of social Darwinism. Um, this was this idea that I've often spoken about that, um, you know, the survival of the fittest, uh, and of course those who are the fittest are those who've made it in society, and the people who are at the bottom of the social echelon, well, you know, that's the way things are, that's the way nature has worked it out. There's no point in trying to change this system with, you know, um, uh, helping the poor or helping these people. They were supposed to be like that. They, in other words, prostitutes were a kind of troglodyte lower class um, whose sexuality was a, a normal thing. Um, bourgeois women, of course, um, didn't feel sexual feelings. They were maternal. That was what femininity was. And for all the sexuality and all of the you know, messy side of things, you went down to the professionals who were in the local brothel and later on the streets. So what you see here is, is quite interesting. You get this sense of bestiality, you know, that these prostitutes, no one is having a good time in these brothels. No one smiles. Everyone looks frozen, bored, stiff. I mean, it's a very interesting take on, on sexuality, if you know what I mean. Now, what, what actually is, is being is shown here um, is this the opposite of the bourgeois ideal of the, of the female as, as controlled, um, artificially controlled with corsets and, and hairdo and as artificial as possible because the natural, of course, is bestial and it's filthy and it's amoral. And this is what this group of people represent. And you'll actually see there's a class transaction going on here. And you'll see this in all of these, paint, these things that I'm going to show you. Um, you have the middle class man, and you can see um, because of the way in which he's dressed, just edging into the picture plane. 
all right, and he's looking pretty apprehensive um, because he's surrounded by, there's the madam there, there's this sort of overabundance of flesh. Do you know what I mean? He's just suddenly, you know, all of his desires are basically thinking, hell, what am I doing here? Do you know what I mean? It's, it's that sort of sense. He's not, he's not, he's not leering. He's not thinking, wacky do. Um, here, here he's looking very, very much as, as though he wished he could actually go back out of the picture plane uh, as you would if you were confronted with this sort of apparition. Now, um, I want to actually compare these. This is the work of Dugar, which will, um, who is not the mentor, but the great inspirer of Thorin, many years younger than him. And so you get the same sort of take um, on um, social interactions, interclass interactions. Here you have um, the client, um, again, who is seen as a, you know, in the black bourgeois outfit. And he's um, confronted by this sort of pyramid of sort of cavorting flesh, which is emphasized by the uh, striped stockings and so on. And here he's looking really as though he can't make up his mind. He, he can't make a choice. He really doesn't look as though he's, he's particularly enjoying himself. He's clutching onto his umbrella in a certain amount of anxiety. Now, um, I want to give you another one of his when I don't actually have the um, uh, uh, painter's name. It means it is for her. Um, here we have more of this sense of the promiscuity um, of the salon in, in the brothel where you get um, all these women who look absolutely identical. They just represent flesh for sale. Um, but the bourgeois man, again, is sort of completely sort of squashed and stuck in between them. Uh, you know, again, he's looking at that one, he's being caressed by this one, you know, what is he going to do? It doesn't really look as though it's as terrific as all that. Um, I want to compare that with the other person who influences uh, Forain, Manet. Um, here you have something quite different. Here you have the person who is being bought, one assumes, Nana, um, who is actually, um, has great subjectivity. She's not just the object of his gaze and she's not just the object of our gaze. She looks back at us. She's the one who's commanding the scene. She's the one who's basically, you know, making the money. You know, she's looking back and saying, yes, well, aren't I beautiful? Yeah, well, I'm worth it. And this fellow here, again, is being pushed out of the frame. And in fact, he looks really quite silly and superfluous. So here you have really um, sort of the autonomy of the modern woman, which is a very different take from that that you actually have with Forin. This is Forin's take on it, um, which is quite different. Um, she's seen as someone who is really, you know, in the middle of a transaction. She doesn't, she, we just look at her. She has no, uh, there's no sense of autonomy. Uh, she's doing what she's told. He's not even interested in her. It's just going to be over and done with. There's this real sense of alienation um, between people, and which is, of course, the essence of the modern city as Forin sees it. And here we have um, Toulouse the Trek. Um, two of you here will remember this at the Augusta Museum, um, with again the um, the bourgeois here, uh, sort of almost like a voyeur, right? Um, and this is what you get in uh, Dugas' paintings and in Forin's. The um, it's the gaze which is the possession, rather than any sort of physical movement. Um, the, you know, the gaze and the possession that way is is really the transaction, as we'll see. Now. Um, as opposed to these men being sort of, you know, out of their place in these brothels, you get um, Toulouse Trek, who of course will be inspired by Forain. All right, so you're going to see the same sort of brushwork, um, which comes out of the Impressionist movement. This presence of the um, artist in the work, uh, and Forain very much wants to show that he's present because he's someone who is showing an opinion about society. So therefore he wants to, to show his presence by the way he paints. It's not supposed to be an eternal vision of prostitution or something like that. It's my take on society. Um, so this is what this is the kind of view that um, Toulouse the Trek had it. You couldn't get anything <laughs> less erotic. Um, here are these people with their hair in curlers chatting over over a glass of wine and lunch and sort of you know talking about last night's clients. Do you know what I mean? There's nothing particularly spicy going on. And here you actually have a, the almost the same thing. Two prostitutes, one of whom's got her little boy who's dressed up to go for his first communion. So in many ways you get this sort of irony that you know life in a brothel is actually much warmer and sort of, you know, when you get rid of the clients, um, a much better place probably than the bourgeois household itself for, for, from which the clients actually are fleeing. Now, um, Forin also, and I'm going to talk about his use of line drawings, um, you will notice that this, um, that she's standing against a pillar which advertises one of Wiesmann's novels. 
Um, this is an, another um, aspect of prostitution which was greatly commented on at the time. Um, remember that this is the time of entrepreneurs, um, the new city of Paris. Um, people was, men were starting to get sick of going to the brothel uh, where everyone were lined up. They wanted this idea of sort of, you know, um, adventure, um, of, of, uh, of conquest, you know, as they did in the world of affairs. Uh, and so they wanted to be able to go out and seduce people on the street. And of course, so this means that you get a new class of prostitutes who are dressed up as though they are respectable middle class women. This could happen, of course, because of the department stores, right, which were now selling ready-made clothes, fashion, you know, was going down to all classes, everyone looked more or less the same. And so you're actually having a great confusion as to who's who, who's a respectable woman who isn't on the streets. So here he has this idea of the street walkers. You can sort of tell that she's not a respectable woman, no respectable woman would be out there smiling by herself in public. Now, um, he does a, a whole series of, of these paintings, um, which you could hardly say this is the ambiguity of modern life. I mean, let's face it, no bourgeois woman would be out there dressed in red, leaning in a provocative pose against a central post in the middle of the Luxembourg Gardens. Um, but um, it's, it's, he's showing every one of his um, canvases or sketches is a comment on life. It's a continual comment on, on what life is about and usually not a very nice side of life. Now, um, he wasn't the only one who was looking at um, prostitution. In fact, I think this scene is in the documentary. It might be in next week's. Um, actually, I'm standing freezing cold in this, on this particular street. Um, but this is the same idea about how you, the ambiguity and the alienation of the modern city. I mean, who is this woman? Is she a, a, a correct woman who's just going for a walk? Or is she actually someone who's trying to attract this client up there? Uh, you can't really tell. And it's only until the next canvas that he paints, which is called The Transaction, where you get the two of them standing together and you realise that there's been this, something has happened. All right? So it, it's impossible, it's almost impossible for us as viewers to tell, um, even though it's been given a title which sort of really should give it away, what's she waiting for? And of course, also in other lectures, we've looked at Tissot's um, political woman. Um, and this really sort of showcases the fact that the bourgeoisie themselves, are, they're not actually selling themselves in brothels, but women had to be sold on the marriage market, you know, for they had to be as innocent and as stupid as, as, as possible so that they would be married into the correct type of family. So again, it was a kind of um, flesh market, even though this is a respectable one. And of course, then by the time you get here, you're not sure of the status of this woman. Um, by now, prostitutes have moved so much upper into the upper echelons that courtesans are moving in respectable society. Is she a courtesan? Is she a respectable woman? You know, is she his daughter? It, um, it's all becoming very, very hard to tell. And this is the essence of modernity, as indeed it is now. Who can tell who's who? You don't know who you might be sitting next to. Um, right, you've got the debutante here. This is one of his sketches, um, Forin's sketches. Um, again, sort of showing this side, and actually I couldn't get the caption that went underneath this, and it sort of says, well, what do you think is going to become of you? you know, and so the idea is, for God's sake, you know, get up, flirt with the fellow with the false teeth and the bad breath, um, oh. do your bit, and get married to the right sort of person. So it's, it's very much, you know, this rather portly, ghastly woman telling this young girl, what her duty is. It's, it's to, you know, capture the marriage market. And here we have, you know, again, one of his terrific paintings, I sort of think. He, we, he uses the impression of style and palette, but again, this ambiguity of modern space. I'm going a little bit quickly because I've got to get through. Now, um, he, uh, I want to edge into the world of the theatre, the world of spectacle, uh, because spectacle, of course, again, is, you don't know whether it's fact or fiction. Uh, this is the whole uh, thing that he is actually playing on. And here um, we have a, a woman at the opera. Now, um, the opera or the theatre, of course, no one's slightest bit interested in what's happening on stage. It's over here. She's not looking. She's looking over here. They're looking over there. He's looking at another woman over here with his binoculars. So the, the, the play was just the pretext to be there. The real spectacle is in the um, opera itself. And so here we have this woman, at the same time quite imperious, you know, looking to the side, but also sort of, you know, very open to offers. Um, she's clearly some, someone or a demi-mondaine. 
um, waiting to be picked up in the corridors of the opera. All right, she's clearly not dressed well enough to be really one of the wives of the abonné. So there we have um, a very interesting way in which it's set out, and you can see he's, dra he's a great draftsman uh, for her, and you see the, the way in which this is with the line across the middle, um, red, red, broken by patches of grey here and here. So it's very, very well um, set up. Now, I want to look at the wings of the opera and the, and the ballet and the exchanges that were going on. Now, uh, French society at the time uh, was dominated by this rising class of the bourgeoisie and the opera in particular um, was um, kept going. It, it wasn't a state-owned opera. It was kept going by the money paid by the gentlemen of the jockey club. So therefore, these people had huge power in deciding what was put on, how it was put on, and when. And so um, these, instead of having serious operas, you always have operas that have lots of ballets. The ballets have to be in the third act because these, women, these men want to take out their young protégés. Uh, and they actually also had power over the kind of ballets. In other words, um, at this time, men or male dancers more or less are eliminated from the repertoire because these men uh, who are the patrons, who, you know, pat pat the patrons of the little dancers, don't even want sort of male rivals on stage with these little girls. So you get these bizarre um, sorts of ballets. You know, we're not talking last in feet or anything. These are the ballets for the, um, where it looks almost like lesbian fantasies with the little girls sort of fr flirting with each other. And the, the girls, of course, are not, um, the ballerinas aren't great professional dancers. They're often people who have been drawn from lower middle class or particularly working class families. And it was known that um, this was the first step on the rung of prostitution. Uh, well, not prostitution exactly, but being, um, getting a patron and becoming um, a, a kept woman. Because these little girls would earn more by being in the corps de ballet probably for one performance and their, their father would maybe for half a year. And of course they could rise up through the ranks and become one of the great horizontals, one of the great courtesans. So it was the gentlemen of the jockey club who choose the dancers very often for their looks rather than for their uh, talent. I mean, nothing much has changed, has it? So what we have here um, is this invasion of almost the body snatchers in many ways you could call it that. These um, black sort of um, body, you know, men in the black, and it, these aren't the painters who make them look like that. The middle class men always wore black, nothing but black. It was, a, you know, the symbol of the bourgeoisie. And they contrast with the fluffy little um, dancers. Now, um, all of these men were allowed backstage. Um, they all had their own little dancer, maybe a couple, whom they patronised, and by that means that whose favours they um, they bought, uh, and in fact the expression avoir sa, sa danseuse means to have, have a little fling on the side or to have a little pet hobby, right? It was such a, an obvious thing to have a dancer, right? <coughs> um, now that was Beryl. Beryl was a sort of society painter and he really is just painting um, what he sees as reality. <coughs> um, what we have here is Dugas um, in 1877 painting his take on, on the ballet. Now, he was someone who was fascinated by this world. He was someone who sort of wasn't, I don't know if you call him a voyeur, but he spent his entire life looking at, at people in, you know, the backs, you know, back wings of the opera or in brothels. And here he shows the sort of rather shadowy, slightly sort of um, uh, sinister presence of this dark shape that we see from behind. And you don't actually see them. Do you see what I mean? They're anonymous figures lurking. Uh, and here you see them lurking, just the body parts of the little girl's legs and the legs um, of these people who um, are clearly at home in the dancer's space, right? So the dancers are there to please them, not really to perform in any other way. So. This then is this interpenetration of the world of the arts by the bourgeoisie. Now, this is Forin's take on this. Now, you can see he's using um, a much uh, lighter brush strokes here to give the frothiness um, of the, the dancers' dresses. Now, Forin, if he wasn't interested 
in the world of nature, he was fascinated by artificial light. And in fact, in most of his paintings, that's one of the, one of the reasons why he was interested in uh, ballet and why he's interested in the performances, because most of them are under bright lights, the beginning of, of gas lighting. Uh, 1890, they might even have had electricity at this time. So what you have here then is this transaction but of, you know, between these uh, little rats, as they're called, they are, because they used to run around the opera and make little sounds like little pitter patter pitter pitter on the, on the stairs, and so they were called the rats of the opera. Uh, and here you have these two girls talking to each other innocently. Now, she looks so beautiful and innocent. She's even got her hair down her back. She's got the tutu on. Uh, but here's this man lurking in the distance. It's almost you feel like saying, look out, he's behind you. Um, he's coming in and he's spotted her. Um, but is actually the transaction as, as innocent as that, or is she posing beautifully, you know, so that she can be seen in her best light? She's certainly not sort of thinking, oh, so I'm glad I've got over that, or having a cigarette, or, you know, a cup of coffee. She's very much posed as, as someone who is ready to be bought, um, as indeed is her friend. So there's a certain ambiguity about the transaction that is taking place here. Um, there's less ambiguity about this. Um, here you have um, this sense of violence in many ways. Um, the rather bestial looking uh, bourgeois who um, is completely upright and he's just grabbing this girl as though he's giving her face a bit of a tweak but it's clearly yanking her towards him and see the way her body is bent trying to get away. All right, so there's this forain already just with a few lines, um, is giving um, a description of the, of the real reading of this, this piece of, of art. Um, you know, and a fairly plain background, just, you know, the, the ballet more or less over there, and this idea of this coercion that is happening here in this relationship. Now, the character that we saw there is someone who will appear throughout his career. He's the bourgeois gommeux. Gommeux means someone who has his hair slicked back with, you know, cream or whatever it is and he's always side on or back on um, with his flower with usually with flowers looking rather sort of self-important and, and awkward um, this is one of his very early sketches and you'll see um, he uses a kind of hatching which later on he, he will um, have mastered just one or two single lines to get his message across um, I just I think I'll just have to go through that um, the, uh, we move now from the backstage into the dressing rooms of these little girls. So in other words, we're moving further and further into their sort of intimate spaces. And um, you get very much the way in which this girl here is stuck between this woman who is probably her mother. All right. Now, the mothers worked as almost pimps in this situation. They were delighted that their daughters were going to actually finally get into a situation where they, as a family, can relax because their, their daughter will have um, a wealthy protector. So this is probably the mother tarting her up for the stage. Here's the protector uh, looking pretty bestial, but you know, she is literally stuck between the two of them. Um, and he's just watching. You know what I mean? There's this sense of, of possession, which you now get here in um, this uh, lithograph by Thorin in 1895, um, which I think shows the relationship very much. There's the, the mother, who's often described as the dresser, but is usually one and the same. Um, the girl, you know, has no private space at all. You know, she's trying to get ready to go out and dance and getting dressed. And of course, this man is just standing watching. You know what I mean? There's no chat, there's no interaction, he's just watching. You know, it's all this sort of voyeurism uh, and possession. Um, no expression on his face at all. Um, you have the same thing happening here with an actress. The poor girl doesn't seem to be rehearsing her lines, which is what I'd be doing, but she's sitting there, and this is this interest in artificial light. Can you see that? Um, the dark spaces over here, which are the symbolically dark spaces with this woman with a very large sort of... Uh, bust there, who is probably her mother, um, working on her hair at the same time showing the hair off um, and in some kind of transaction. With, can you see the face of this character, the way in which he's very similar to those other ones we saw? So that's the darkness and in the light you get this sense of the rather the vulnerability um, of this person who is for sale. Uh, um, uh, and you've got the flowers that have been brought for her. Now, um, Forain was taking up uh, very much uh, where Dugas had left off. Dugas had worked with um, uh, a Jewish writer, <coughs> Paul Alevi, 
who was the librettist for Offenbach, who wrote, you know, La Vie Parisienne and so on, La Belle Hélène. In fact, there's an Offenbach on at the moment um, uh, in, in, the, in the city. Uh, and, uh, of course, they would eventually uh, fall out. Um, one of the reasons was that Alivi wrote um, a work on, called The Cardinal Family, which talks about the mother of two um, eligible young dancers, um, Pauline and Virginia, who um, are always seen backstage um, fending off the advances um, of these bourgeois people. Uh, as you can see them here, they're really stuck yeah, in, in being enclosed by these middle-class men. Now, um, what actually happens and why their relationship breaks up is that Alevi notices that um, progressively the illustrations that Dugas is providing for his novel or, or his book um, are becoming, starting to become more and more anti-Semitic. And if you actually look at these, these people here, they're beginning to have the um, features of what is going to become the eternal... Jewish features, which will be, um, be um, part of the anti-Semitic movement around the Dreyfus affair. And so there's a big falling out between them. They've been very close friends. From our point of view, what is of interest is that it's the same sort of subject matter that we have here. Here we have Forin's take on it. He's the little girl getting dressed. And there's this ghastly mother arranging with this ga even more ghastly fellow um, the price of her daughter. Um, and here we have some of these... Um, social satire that will show the same girl in the morning in her little attic and in the evening they're uh, sitting as a ballerina. Now I just wanted to quickly um, have a look at these two paintings here. Um, these then are these little girls, they're very very similar. Um, you'll notice that the girls um, look exactly the same whereas in each of the, the two paintings the um, predator or the bourgeois um, is an individual. Uh, can you notice that their, their faces? And so what you have here in particular is you have class distinction, the little working class girl tarted up, you know, rather sort of awkwardly sitting there. She doesn't quite know what to do with her legs and, and the, the high heel sneakers sort of. Um, you get the difference of class, you get the difference of age. You notice he's old and she's very young, probably 14, 15, these young dancers. Um, you have also sort of a class type or as a class, uh, as an individual. And in between you have the transaction she's being lured with the flowers and that the same thing is happening here. Now what is interesting is that um, Forain also does a number of uh, fans and this fan actually shows what goes on at the opera. Um, you get the transition from being um, him arriving with uh, the man arriving with these two women who are his wife and daughter and sort of sitting there respectively at the opera. He's, his friend's sort of slipping out the back and this is what's going to go on behind the scenes. At no time does anyone mention the opera, you know, don't mention the war. I mean, who, who got, who's interested in the opera? It's all about what's going on being seen and these sorts of transactions. Um, but also, even if you're not a ballet dancer, you know, you can still be bought and sold. And here you get this, um, what he excels at is this instantaneous um, something just happening. So here we have a woman walking along at, at the, at the uh, interval, um, turning around and you see the person, he, he's put a lot of white on the, on the uh, Englishman's face here. So that's the person we're supposed to be looking at. And you get this moment when she's walking along and she just looks back. Do you, do you see this sort of instantaneous sort of movement, um, this, this swirling mass of people in which suddenly an encounter, a transaction is going to take place. Um, he's also very interested in um, the tutus of the ballerinas because of the um, interest in artificial light. I just need to move along a little bit. Um, of course, he's encouraged by Dugas, as you know, who paints so many of the um, ballerinas in unusual poses um, because of his interest in Japanese prints coming in at odd angles, the way in which people are, are cut out of frames and so on. I just wanted to show you the continuity with the work um, of Toulouse-Lautrec who takes up many of the same themes but doesn't have that cynical edge to it that, um, that Forain does. Uh, Forain is the consummate social commentator. To, uh, Toulouse Trek isn't. He has great sympathy for these people. He paints them as they are. Here you see the exhaustion, the sort of, you know, just a girl who pulled up her tights and sat down. There's very much, very different from the Forain take. Um, I just wanted to 
bring it to end this section on the theatre and this idea of spectacle and fiction reality and all of these things that are going on um, is this very popular view of um, a woman in the opera. You'll notice that we don't have any paintings of a man sitting in the opera. All right, it's because of this idea of the ambiguity of women once they're in a public space. You know, you, there's always what's going on, you're never terribly sure. Uh, and so what you have here then um, is again a very structured painting with a kind of a triangle here um, with bands of red, pink, black, black, red. It's very, very structured. Uh, and we're pushed right into this. You notice, however, that she's not looking, but we are doing the looking and she's being looked at. Very different, remember, from Cassatt that we looked at last week, where the women themselves, are, they have a subjectivity. They're not just there to be objects of our gaze. They are actively engaged in the social situation. However, it's the same structure, this idea of, of up close, which you get from the Japanese prince, and this idea of the uh, crowd uh, in the opera. Now, um, I just wanted to look at other, other performances that interested him. This is the acrobat, and here he's very interested. He throws us right into the crowd. Can you see we're sort of more or less right part of this mass of moving people here? And what interests him is the light, artificial light on their faces. They're just being pulled up here. The more light there, the light shining up her legs through the tutu, and then the very dark blue sky beyond. Um, and also very much this socially on the emphasis of this woman who's performing, you know, to save her life, you know, to, to, to earn enough, putting her life on, on the edge, literally, and really no one could give a damn. Uh, you know, it's, it's sort of um, the anonymity, um, the solitude of the city, the solitude in a crowd. And I wanted to compare that with Miss Lala, um, at the Circus Fernando uh, in um, Dugas' painting. Uh, this would have been up on the uh, uh, Boulevard Rochechouart. Have any of you been to the Boulevard Rochechouart with me? None, none of you. All right, now I want to, just before um, we go on to his p political work, um, I want to look at the way in which he treats a few themes, and in particular this idea that... Uh, he learned from money. Um, it's very much a sort of uh, two-way process uh, where money looks at, uh, clearly is influenced by Thorin's work. Now this of course is the last great work of money. He was already very, very ill when he painted this and asks um, Suzanne, who's the bartender or the cell, the verse as she was, um, to come and pose in his studio because of course he was too ill to actually go and work at the Folie Berger. And he sets, up his, he sets up a counter in his studio and he um, sets up the still life and he actually had been given um, a whole crate of tangerines which is why you happen to have them here. So of course this is the consummate painting of interrogation of modern life. You know, um, she is a fashionable woman no? and fashion now is being used as a kind of disguise. Um, you can be fashionable and then it's very hard to tell what class you belong to because fashion is something in itself, right? She's clearly not a bourgeois woman but she, you can't tell what else she is because she's wearing the things that make her look as though she might be a bourgeois. So it's a kind of disguise with makeup and clothes you can almost be anything you want. So there's that, there's this anonymity of this person but also this idea of um, where court she appears to be looking at us. She's, she's the, again, the symbol of the woman in the modern sphere. She doesn't really um, interact with us. She looks straight beyond us, you know, a bit like the flaneur. Um, she doesn't acknowledge our presence any more than she acknowledges the presence of this person who is trying to engage her here. So um, this and this person are both the same. How can they be the same? The perspective doesn't work. Um, this is what it's like to be in the modern city. You don't know your place. You don't know how you're perceived. You really don't know what image is being bought or sold of you. <laughs> and I know that. Um, we now have the mirror here. Are we here? Are we there? Uh, you know, a very, very interesting reflection, literally, of modern life. But also, what is the status of this woman? Is she just like these upright bottles? Uh, all of these things you notice are perpendicular as she is? Is she just one of an element which is to be bought and sold, tasted and thrown away? 
Uh, is this what the transaction of modern life is all about? Anyway, if you look at that, and uh, the importance also of modern lighting, by the way, artificial lighting that is foregrounded here, I want you to actually look at the first sketch which was made by Manet in 1881 for this painting. Now, it, it doesn't look at all like the final drawing, does it? Um, it's done in that very, very sketchy brushwork that which we are now familiar of with with, with fire. Um, but uh, you do have the same elements. You have this reflection and this idea of you can't tell the, what's going on, whether this man is actually buying a drink or is he speaking to her or is he us, the spectator, uh, and so on. And you now need to look at uh, the Folie Berger of 1878, which is that 1881, um, of Forain. And he is actually possibly the person who has inspired Manet to look at it in this way. Um, here you have the salvers. It looks as though she's another person, but in actual fact it's her reflection. Here you have this person speaking to her, where is he, uh, and so on. So all of those disorienting elements are already present in Forain's painting. However, um, if you look at Chez, it should be Le Père La Tuile, um, this is a painting done in, uh, up in Montmartre, just near the Place Pigalle, um, a kind of courtship ritual, if you could call it that, um, of two people in an open-air cafe, uh, posed by two friends of Manet. And if you look at that, 1879, 1879, we have the lunch by Forain. And so it is fairly clear that he was actually present at this posing session and has painted um, in, uh, this is... Um, watercolour, um, painted the same scene, uh, but just from a slightly different point of view, right? So there's a tremendous influence, as you can see, with of Degas and Manet uh, with Forain. Now, um, in 1884, um, he is accepted finally at the Salon, uh, but does continue to um, expose, uh, to exhibit at the um, Impressionist exhibition. And uh, this, of course, you can understand why. This is a very sort of, you know, bourgeois moment, isn't it? You know, when people pause at the, out of the dancing to come and, and have something uh, nice to eat uh, at the buffet. It's very different from the way in which Zola describes the buffet. So it's all very ordered. It's, all, it's, it's a kind of in praise of the ordered world of the bourgeoisie. Um, and he also has another piece accepted, um, which is a woman smelling flowers, which is um, a, quite an interesting painting. Um, here it's in watercolour. Here you have this homage to Japanese art. With the, You come into the painting via the fan. Um, but this woman who is, um, is captured at a specific moment when she's actually um, not just being, exhibiting herself but actually enjoying herself um, and um, bending over to smell the flowers. So um, this is in many ways what Forain um, actually excels at, is, is capturing a moment, uh, which of course is what um, caricature or, or social you know, satire is all about. Now, he uh, started out, as we saw at the beginning, with working with the satirist Gilles, and by the time he went into the Third Republic, um, the laws governing uh, censorship have been incredibly uh, loosened. Uh, under, in 1848, under the, at the time, oh, I won't, that's not, of, of um, Honoré Dormier, whose work you'll see in a moment, who was the great satirist also, who inspires Forain, um, you would be sent to prison for representing the king, you know, in, a, in an adverse way. And of course, under the uh, Second Empire, under Napoleon III, there were draconian laws about the way in which things could be reported. Uh, and people had great fines and prison sentences. But by the time you get to the um, Third Republic, theoretically this has been loosened and uh, social satire is in all of the papers. Um, also, it's a lot easier um, to be able to actually produce them quickly because technology has advanced. You don't have to do the hard lithographic work and so on. So um, to be a social satirist is a, is a much easier task. Now, um, Forain is known and becomes famous um, for not just his, his ability to sketch and get these ideas um, across, but for the captions that he actually writes. And he writes them himself. Um, for example, Honoré uh, uh, Daumier 
had someone else write the captions, so which often don't stick so well, whereas here you get the, the flow of the two of them. And he became quite feared uh, in, in the social circles, but every newspaper vied for his work. So he would be um, often in the same week, would appear in several different newspapers, in the Figaro, for example, and even the New York Times were working on, uh, you, you just used to commission his work. So he, he had actual international fame as a, a social satirist. Now here you've got here, oh, I hear you're very in with so-and-so, and he says, oh, don't worry about that. All he's got on me is my word, you know. So this sort of idea of the sort of um, the worthlessness of, of the bourgeoisie, um, in particular social satire here, there's this, again, that what you've seen in his paintings of the way in which young girls are bought and sold. Here's this girl trying to pay the rent and she, to this great fat you know, fellow, and she says, so, so like this, I don't owe any rent. You know, uh, again, this, you know, sexual trading uh, of the bourgeoisie. Um, and also he makes fun, in particular, of the bourgeois pretentious sort of art taste. So here you have someone who quite possibly, by 1912, um, is seen as being a Jewish dealer, again, because a lot of the art dealers were Jewish, the great dealers of the time, Seligman, Kramer, and so on, who um, are going to, you know, facilitate their fruitsy collections and so on, um, will be Jewish. And, and this, once you see these black beards, often that's what it is, and this will be interesting when we talk about this in a moment. So he's actually um, showing what looks like a worthless sketch to this big fat fellow who just wouldn't have a clue and is going to buy it. And it's the same thing with Dormier. You see this, this idea. Um, but also he's very keen on showing the downtrodden here, of course, a woman who's been evicted with the children, her pathetic um, little few bits and pieces are on the, the pavement, everything being carted away. So it's, um, he's, he's a strange mixture, as, as we'll see, of, of sort of, of, of nationalism and so on. Now he goes from political satire, from social satire to political satire. And this, uh, in particular, at the time of the Dreyfus case. Now, Dreyfus, of course, you know, the Jewish captain who is accused of uh, international espionage on the basis of something that a femme de ménage found in a rubbish tin uh, wasn't even his handwriting in the first place. Um, but um, it, in actual fact, it's a huge cover-up for leaks that were actually occurring within the French army itself. Dreyfus is sent off to Devil's Island where he is put into solitary confinement. He loses all his teeth. He virtually can hardly speak when he comes back. It's an appalling case of um, this particular man actually being demonised um, over issues that were much deeper than that, um, which were the divisions between <coughs> the left of society, which were the so socialists and the republicans, and on the other side you've got the church and the army who are and it's all coalesces around the Jewish question, right? The church and the army are, of course, solidly anti-Semitic, and the others are for um, the truth. <laughs> uh, and, of course, it will take... It goes on for something like 10 or 15 years. It's not something that goes on for a while. And this is um, Dreyfus being uh, court-martialed uh, before he's sent off. Now, of course, you're going to get... Emil Zola, who um, is exasperated when, even when someone from the army says this is a setup, we have to have him tried again. It's, you know, if the army itself realizes something wrong, and the person in the army is is sent out of the army, uh, and uh, Dreyfus is condemned yet again, Zola sends his letter to the paper. Jacques, I accuse that you know the president of the republic. I accuse you of this. And this caused furor, and so. Forin, who apparently is for the underdog, sets up his own newspaper called Psst, you know, Shh, you know, with the um, subsidies from Dugas and Barres. Barres was a, a virulently anti-Semitic writer. Uh, and he starts producing these caricatures um, of society. And here, if they're not of, of Jews, you actually show, um, here you have, um, and we put up with this. What he's referring to is here the judiciary, who were now members of the judici judiciary, were rising up against the army uh, to show up what was going on. And so you get he's showing that you've got the judiciary kicking the army, the, the hat of the army. In other words, that the judiciary is more powerful than the army. What's wrong with France? All right. Now he was a, a very incredibly nationalistic man, as you will see, and I think he saw. 
um, this is issue as, as being, you know, France's uh, sanctity being violated by this sort of international brotherhood of the Jews. Uh, it, it's that seems to be what his ideas were. Um, I went to an exhibition on Thorheim just when I've been in Paris, and they skip the, the whole of the Petit Palais is set up um, with his work, and they have two three little cartoons of this period, you know, they don't want to mention it too much and there's no explanation as to why we get this seemingly bizarre um, aspect to his work. Anyway, um, he also, um, if you look at it, he, he also turns this, which only lasts a couple of months, it, it doesn't last very long. Um, he actually, uh, in the background you can't see, there's an electoral notice there um, where one of the Republicans were standing for election and it's sort of he's blaming the Republicans for the fact that you know there isn't enough food for the poor and so um, he shows this man who's you know keeled over after drinking too much absinthe when sort of saying well if there's no nothing to eat of course you can't blame absinthe all right so putting all the ills of society um, on the back um, of the Republicans but you, know, you will see that um, quite apart from the social message now you have this ability in a blank page with a few lines to get this sense of despair and abandonment. He's, he's really honed his trade. Now he was, as I said, a very, very powerful man by this time. Now I just wanted to show you this sort of anti-Semitic business. We've already looked at Dugar right back in 79, this idea of um, the Jewish confraternity controlling the affairs, finances. Here you've got them see clearly this sort of caricature of, of a Jewish person They're whispering to each other, the, the control um, of finances, and you get the same sort of thing with Forain. Um, um So he continues, even with his paintings, his um, critique of um, the judiciary as well, those of whom are not um, on the side of the uh, anti de uh, uh, anti the So here you've got this sort of arrogant, um, you know, solicitor or barrister whose hand is being kissed, you know, by the grateful poor. Um, very similar to Honoré Daumier's um, uh, depictions of the arrogance of, of, of lawyers. He, and, and here's this fellow pleading, this fellow's sound asleep, he's asleep and he's snoring. Um, and um, the same sort of arrogance here. Uh, again, this idea that uh, the, the poor are, are being treated badly by the courts. Um, this is another scene in court where the, the poor are trying to work out what's going on. But here you're getting this illusion being brought back in again of some kind of sexual transaction, which um, comes out very, very clearly here. You've got this rather sort of lascivious looking sort of lawyer leaning over to this woman who's, who's clearly not short of a two, of, you know, two bob, but sort of sitting you know, in a rather provocative position. Uh, and so you wonder what the transition, uh, transaction is going on here. Now, um, at this time also, you um, have Forain starting to um, move into other areas of, of art. And this is, I think, is what's so interesting about him in relation to the other Impressionists, is that he, he works across all fields and has an impact on society uh, with his work at the time. It's interesting that we don't know much about him now, but he was very important at the time. Um, I just want to give you this picture of uh, the Boulevard des Italiens, just down from the opera, frequented by all of the uh, people uh, in Zola's novels, all of the politicians, the who's who of the arts community. And particularly one of these cafes, the Café Riche, um, was one of the important hangouts where the de Goncourt and you know, the Proust's and people later on would meet. And um, to modernise it, um, they asked Forin if he would do a series of mosaic, large mosaic uh, pieces that would be stuck on the facade. Now, I've got this old postcard that shows you what this would have looked like. So this is a most unusual um, Art Nouveau, Art Deco style, um, Art Nouveau I suppose it would be at that time, uh, decoration. Uh, normally you just, up until now, you had the Second Empire, uh, white stone, uh, wrought iron balconies and so on, but now you've got these large colourful pieces um, of, of, of art. And of course he does, he works with an Italian mosaicist, Facchino, so you get the two Fs often as a signature, but even here he uses this 
Comédie Parisienne. And he, in a lot of his work, for example, a lot of his caricatures um, were so sought after that they would be bound together in a book. And one of the books that was published was called the Comedy, the Parisian Comedy. And comedy, it's not in the sense of ha ha, uh, it's more in the sense of the divine comedy of Dante. Right, the comedy being a kind of an act, you know, or one not knowing the part that one plays, the kind of uh, society as it is seen. So these scenes are now put up in large on the um, facade of the buildings. And here you have this idea of a, a kind of a secret transaction taking place. Same thing here. Um, particularly, I love this one, a woman with a, um, a mask on. Uh, again, this sort of ambiguity of women in a public space, but, you know, you, not too much ambiguity, but at least she looks as she's enjoying herself. Um, the modern woman as well. Um, look at the modern woman. She's smoking. I mean, you know, and she's in, in bloomers and she's on a bike. I mean, what is society coming to? Um, also, you've got another modern woman who's out delivering parcels, but again, there's this undercurrent of this idea that often when you ordered a hat, you often, you know, got the girl who went with the delivery girl came and, you know, in fact, men often bought hats for the delivery girl. And here you've got the scenes of, 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 of Paris, you know, the, the sounds of Paris, you know, people crying their wares, you know, here, or you hear this, hear this. And he even actually has a picture of himself. Um, and, but you can see that um, by now, you can tell that he's a, an artist because he has these really funny socks with, um, red socks with yellow spots on them. And he's seen sketching, so he's put himself in the picture. But you can see the influence of Carpeau's work. Um, this, these lines and the moulding um, of the body. Now, um, he, he also does a piece of stained glass in which he um, foregrounds the figure of Jean Avril, you know, the great dancer of, of the Can-Can. Um, again, large bodies of people um, seen from a strange sort of angle. Now, the cafe weren't happy. Uh, there was a huge amount of criticism, and these were all pulled down. And um, a, a couple of them are in the Musée Carnavalet. The others have been lost. Um, in 1891, he, when he's in his 40s, so he marries quite late, he marries a young, beautiful uh, young artist um, who has a great stabilising influence on him. Uh, but it's at this time he starts turning back towards his Catholic roots, which is interesting. Right? Um, when you think that you know, the Affaire de Réjouis is going to break out fairly soon. Uh, and they travel the world together. They go to uh, America, all around the world, um, become quite a sophisticated couple. And in 1900, uh, under the influence of Carl Wiesmann, remember what we saw who wrote Against Nature uh, at the beginning, um, this influential decadent writer, he himself undergoes a sort of um, a resurgence of Catholic Christianity on Christmas Day. And um, influences Forain. And Forain then actually says, uh, after his conversion, everything I've done in the artistic world up to now seems to me utterly vain. And I feel that I will have no rest until I have made total confession and manifested my faith by all, all the means that God has given me. So, I mean, this is a very strange sort of turnaround for someone who's spent most of his life in Bohemia, um, working in the back streets, uh, in the back wings of the opera. So now you get a series of religious paintings. So, I mean, it's really quite unusual. You get walk through this exhibition and you get these absolute changes. And he now um, brings to um, bear all his ability with um, simple lines and caricature. You know, the um, idea of caricature, the empty page with just a few lines telling you something. You get the same thing here with the return of the prodigal son. Um, here is just the single line leading towards the idea of the home, the single few lines here that give the idea of the wanderer, uh, the stick, you know, almost like a pilgrim. And here the two figures clasp together this idea of, you know, um, forgiveness, which is, of course, central to Christian dogma. Now, he became, he really got into this sort of, you know, Catholic thing. He used to go to Lourdes every year uh, and used to paint the crowds at Lourdes. And in fact, it was after his last visit to Lourdes that he died. So he was, you know, wasn't just, you know, 
a lip service con con you know, conversion or, or reuniting of his faith. It was very uh, intense. Uh, and of course he was um, drawing on some of the etchings of Rembrandt, if you actually look at the form there. Um, other painters at the time were seen to be under... It, it was a time of religious renewal. It was a time of um, great upheaval in society and some people went back towards Catholicism. This is the time you get the doctrine of the bleeding heart and so on. Um, so here you have the return of the prodigal son by the great society painter Tiso, the, the one who gave us the society woman. Um, but he also paints the departure of the prodigal son, um, something that he feels very much because of his son going off to war. And this is really, I suppose, what I want to talk about now, is that at the age of 62, and that's a significant age, um, the, Second World, the First World War breaks out and he is extremely nationalistic uh, and he enlists and will go and work in the camouflage division of the French army, um, setting up false trees from which you could spy on the enemy and in fact telling the Italians on the front line how to set up false trees. I mean, the mind boggles, but anyway... Um, it's no wonder that the French really had a few problems in the First World War. But anyhow, we have um, Forain out there with the other soldiers and um, experiencing what they are going through. Now, uh, Forain saw his engagement in the war um, as being that of an, the, uh, being a, a, a Frenchman, uh, and he saw that the he thought the French were upholding all of these eternal ideas of fraternity, of respect for others, uh, um, uh, you know, national characteristics that were eternal. And he saw the war, really, against the Germans as being a war between good and evil. So he interpreted it very much in Christian terms and was determined to do something about it. And I think that's what um, attracts me so much to his work, was that he actually didn't sort of sit in the south, you know, eating cassoulet like, like Renoir uh, or the others who every time there was, a, you know, something that was difficult just disappeared because of their art. He was someone who was prepared always to participate in society one way or another. Now, um, his work um, was famous because... Uh, and was awaited every week. Uh, and it was greeted with, with great acclaim both by civilians and by the soldiers themselves because there actually were great divisions you know as the war wore on it became obvious that you know it was going to be a hard tough slog and the conditions in the first world war in the in the front line were appalling and um the french were always on the on the French of mutiny because of the conditions under which they were kept by their commanding officers who, who really weren't interested they were sort of commanding from paris so you had this real division between the army who felt they were being sacrificed by the fat civilians in Paris. But they accepted Forain, who was always in the trenches, you know, helping there, actually sketching. And so you've got here, just with a few lines, you get the depth of the trenches. Just with a few splodges, you get the light falling on this. And he doesn't overdo the horrors of the trenches, do you know what I mean? He doesn't have the dead bodies coming up out of the mud, you know. He just sort of says, oh, look, let's hope they can hold out. Who? Oh, the civilians. Do you know what I mean? It's quite a witty sort of turnaround of the whole thing. But he was um, also invokes um, France's past. And here, of course, you have Napoleon, the great victor. The, you know, France can be great again as in the time of Napoleon. So he is invoked. And um, on the... Yena was one of the great unlikely victories that Napoleon pulled off. Uh, and so you get him appearing to um, a soldier, uh, more or less in the same part, on the, on the frontier and saying, I can remember you from the Battle of Vienna. You know, Napoleon was known to, to know different soldiers. I think according to Peter, he'd already, it was a setup, but um, he, you know, used to go amongst the ranks and say, oh, I remember you from such and such a battle. In fact, it had been worked out, but this was what he was known for. But Forain in particular was known, this was what made him the great propagandist. He has this painting, uh, etching here, of the Battle of Verdun, you know, where the uh, Germans could not get further from 11 miles from Verdun. And this was this idea of the last stand um, of the French, that they would not let them get any further. 
in actual fact, of course, you know, between you and me, the Allies have by now had kicked in. You've got the Americans coming into the war and the Germans by now knew that they could not. They didn't have enough manpower to continue to occupy French so soil. Anyhow, the, under these bloody battles, you know, uh, um, with blood spurting everywhere, you've got these, these are actually German corpses. And the, this is the Verdamme, or they will go no further. And this was made up in hundreds of thousands of copies and flown over the enemy lines and dropped. And it was, um, the caption was in, in German, and I don't speak German, but it was, they will go no, f um, it was um, a line from one of uh, Schiller, who's one of the great German poets, and this was, you know, they will not get any further. Now, whether the German army in the trenches were Schiller readers or not, I don't know. But anyhow, he was considered to be an important part of the war effort. At the same time, behind the lines, and this, I think this is really actually quite interesting if you look at who is in this, he, orga he um, made these posters for the poor and for the um, destitute families of the soldiers who were being killed in the trenches. And this is by now, you know, after the Affaire de Refus. And if you look at the patrons of the people who actually um, are the patrons of this charity, you've got the, the Princess Murat, that's the descendant of, uh, you know, Napoleon's people, but the Baron Henri de Rothschild, quite interesting. Uh, and of course other figures such as uh, Carnot's wife and so on, he says, don't forget those who are cold. So a very engaged, as French would engagé, someone who has a social conscience on the one hand, uh, but has political opinions that are odd on the other. Well, he lives right through into the Belle Epoque and um, gives us some wonderful portraits of the who's who of the time. Here we have Yvette uh, Gilbert, you know, that singer from Montmartre, who dressed up like a sort of terribly respectable young woman with long black gloves and a nice little hairdo, and then spoke, sang the most unspeakably obscene things in this frightfully correct sort of diction. Um, and, but here you get um, this portrait of her, this luminous, cheeky personality um, coming out from a, a background that doesn't inform us at all about her social status or her occupation. It's just her that you see. So this is this uh, Forain, um, from his you know, essence of being able to capture a line as a caricaturist, captures the essence of a personality. The same thing with the great poetess, Anna de Noy, who was um, a Romanian, uh, who was a great friend of Marcel Proust. And you get here this sense of languorous, uh, visionary, uh, sort of slightly sensuality. Um, being evoked here of the society woman. Uh, he also was a great friend of the um, artist Jacques-Emile Blanche, who was one of the great society painters of the time and a great mate of his. And so it's almost a caricature of him against a letter screen background. Uh, and um, Jacques-Emile Blanche thought this was, was, was funny, fortunately, uh, and didn't take umbrage of the fact that he looks a bit like a fat, um, porcine person. Um, I think that this last... Um, uh, drawing or, of Clemenceau, who was the president um, of the French Republic and who at the end of the First World War and was responsible for the signing of the Treaty of Versailles uh, and who didn't agree with all that the Allies were putting forward. He didn't agree with you know, the starting up of the League of Nations and so on. And France wanted Alsace-Lorraine back. They wanted reparation, from more reparation from the Germans. And so here you have him um, handing it with the pinchers, more or less. But what he has, he was known as the, the great tiger. You know, this, he was a, an extraordinary figure. He was a doctor. He was a journalist. He was a, a great uh, man. And so here you have this blank page uh, and absolutely nothing, just this authoritative figure um, of Clemenceau who would be um, recognisable to everyone in France. Well, this is him in 18, 1905. You'll notice that unlike Maurice, uh, unlike uh, Mary Cassatt and Caillebotte, he doesn't present himself as a painter. Um, he's presenting himself as a man who seems to be scrutinizing society through, is a great emphasis on the glasses, the looking, you know, just as we had that voyeur who was always looking and the, the blankness behind, which comes very much from the kind of caricature uh, style that he used in the papers. Now, this is this man who then had started out um, uh, on, the, on the pavement, kicked out of, you know, Capo's studio, denied by his father, living in the most abject poverty in Bohemia, 
um, comes to be quite feared, becomes a society figure, and by the end of his life, um, he is a member of the most exclusive clubs in Paris, right? The Jockey Club. I mean, that makes the, the you know Melbourne Club almost look like Hicks in comparison. I mean, it is, was the most extraordinarily difficult place to get into. There he is. He's a member of the Automobile Club, these circles which were absolutely for the elite. Um, he's also now not just a member of the Society of the Beaux-Arts, he's the president of the Society of the Beaux-Arts, the person who is responsible for the Salon, far from being someone who is rejected. He's not just a Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur, he has the highest rank of the Legion of Honour. He has international acclaim, he is um, a member of the Royal Academy. Uh, he's a member of the Royal Academy in Sweden, and the list of accolades goes on and on. So um, this then really, I suppose, is, is a very, very interesting figure who um, was deeply involved in his time, um, experimented successfully with different types of art forms, um, who had a real impact on society through his convictions, uh, his national convictions, his political convictions, his religious convictions, and his artistic convictions. Uh, and I just want to leave you with this last um, painting um, of his, which I think sort of brings together um, many of his, his, his strengths. Um, first of all, the character again of the modern woman, um, isolated and alone in space, looking warily over her shoulder, but um, having been caught by the, just his essential interest in getting just that moment with a line, the painting of modern life, that this idea of the fleeting moment that really decides one's fate, the fact that one is alone in space, that you have to make your, up your own ideas about destiny, but also his style, which here combines that linear style with the nervous brushstroke that he would have developed from his connections with the um, Impressionists. This idea of impatience, um, the presence of the artist, this is my opinion, but this is modern life, grab it now, it's going to be gone. Thank you very much. Thank you.